Doris Kearns Goodwin, welcome back to Meet the Press. I'm so glad to be here and to be with you. Well, I am so honored to be with you and to talk to you about your latest book, An Unfinished Love Story. You have typically written presidential biographies. This is a biography to some extent of your husband, and it is also a love story. What was the process like of writing this book as compared to all of your other incredible works? Well, I was so used to writing about presidents who had archives and I would want to talk to them. I knew them so well because it took me so long to write those books, longer to write the book about World War II than the war to be fought, longer <laughs> to write about the Civil War than twice the Civil War. And I would always ask them questions and they never answered me. So this time I had this guy, my guy, right across the hall from me in the same study and I was able to talk to him and he could answer my questions. And he had an archive that was a mini archive of what presidents have. Um, memos, diaries, letters. He just had saved everything in 300 boxes mm -hmm. and finally decided when he turned 80 to open them. And what it really opened was a door to the 1960s, a decade that I'd lived in, but I was able to learn through him, starting at the beginning with John Kennedy, ending with Bobby Kennedy's death in the Democratic Convention. So we went from beginning to end. It was a great adventure for both of us. And it turned out to be much larger than I thought it was, not a biography of him, but really a history of the 60s at the same time. Yeah, and I, I want to ask you about that treasure trove of boxes that you both discovered. But you do talk about the incredible love, the meeting of the minds that you had with your husband. Did this project, working on this with him, bring you even closer, as you say? You could ask him questions directly? No, no question it did. I mean, we had shared feelings about JFK and LBJ, for example, all of our lives. We argued about them. I was an LBJ loyalist, having worked for him when I was 24 and helped him on his memoir and really knew what an extraordinary president he was despite the war in Vietnam. And he had always been loyal to JFK, even though his greatest work was with LBJ. So we constantly fought about him. You know, he would say, well, the war might not have gone on in the same way if it hadn't been for JFK's assassination. I would say the bills never would have gone through if it hadn't been for LBJ. And when we went through the boxes, the, all of us softened. He softened his feelings, remembered how much he had loved LBJ. I remembered what an inspirational figure JFK was. But more than that, we relived our lives together. I mean, I'd never known him when he was young. And I came to know this, this young guy that I would have fallen in love with even then, 12 years old. I would have been 12 when he was 24. <laughs> but anyway, it, it, was, it was something much more than I knew. It, and it helped him in those last years of his life to feel a sense of worthiness that what he had done really mattered. And, and that gave him great solace and perspective as he was in those last years of his life. You talk about the boxes that you discovered. What was that moment like and what was it like to go through all of those boxes, that material that had been saved of, of your husband's work and his life? Yeah, you know, when, when you're studying presidents and you, you might be able to see a memo or you might be able to see in the library you know, under plastic a draft of a speech, but I could actually see and pick up the draft of the speeches that he helped to work on voting rights or on civil rights or the speech for Bobby Kennedy on Cape Town, um, which was on his grave, and, and see a telegram that Martin Luther King had mm. actually hold it that he had written after one of JF LBJ's speeches. And, and, and you felt like you were part of history all over again. So that's that. those things are treasures, letters and handwritten letters and diaries and journals. I don't know what will happen 200 years from now. People won't have that same degree of intimacy that you have from that material. And I was so glad he saved everything. One of my favorite discoveries was the picture with Ruth Bader Ginsburg in his law class. He's just become president of the Harvard Law Review. And you look at it and you see, yes, your young husband there, but you also see the fact that there are only two women in that photo. Oh, you're so right. I mean, the photo shows him holding the baton and then two women in circles. One is Ruth Bader Ginsburg, another a woman named Nancy Boxley. And right before I came upon that picture, I'd been reading a letter he wrote to his best friend, Dick did, in which he said, they're flying me all over the country to get a job. I can choose it anywhere I can go. I could choose a fellowship or I can be a clerk to a justice. And it's a burden of choice. And I got so mad at him, a burden of choice. She couldn't even get an interview for a job. And he said, well, it's not my fault. And then I found a letter that he had written to her that was on the wall of the Harvard Law Review where he, she was asking for some grace in coming back the second year because she had a baby. And he wrote and he said, I know you already have a new law firm and the baby's now part of the law firm, not reading Mother Goose, but reading briefs. And, and he was able to say to her, you know, just take your time. We'll, we'll make it work. 
and it was such a warm letter to her. He understood that she was working as a mother as well as a second-year student. But then the great thing was that I went and interviewed Nancy Boxley, the other woman, to find out what happened to her. And she was this stately, beautiful woman in her 80s. And she, too, had gotten a job. Unlike, she, unlike Ruth, had gotten a job. But then after she got pregnant, they let her go. And she told me that they said to her, well, we don't feel embarrassed about this. This was Simpson Thatcher Law Firm. But our clients might be making the notion that her stomach was sticking out. But then she told the story that she went back to a 30-year reunion at Harvard. And her professor was a young woman wearing boots, short dress, and was pregnant. And then you <laughs> knew the change had taken place in those 30 years. Yeah, and that's what makes this such a, a captivating account because so much change happened in this time, and I, and I want to talk about all of it. You do describe, though, getting to learn your husband and learn about your husband as a young man before you knew him. What surprised you most? I think I, had, I was always wondering whether or not when he was young he was happy because most of our married life there was a sadness to it. His first wife had died, John Kennedy had died, his best friend Bobby Kennedy had died, Martin Luther King. His career had taken a change because of all that. His life in public service would have been really different had Bobby lived. And yet the man I saw as a young man in the letters that he wrote to his best friend and a hundred letters to his parents greeted every day with a cheerful smile. And he was so filled with joy and happiness. And I was reading those and I came down to breakfast and I said, I would love this guy. I love you. And he said, I, I don't, I'm so glad you do, but it's not me. I rather envy him. And I said, what do you mean? It's you. He said, no, it's not. And it's not just that I'm much, much older now. I've lost something along the way. And it sort of explained this low level of depression that he had had, which interestingly, because we went through the boxes in those last years, and he re remembered all the things that had really mattered that he'd been part of that had changed the country. He loved the country. It's really an unfinished love story, not just about me and Dick, but about our feelings about America. He shaped the changes, and I'd like to think I was able to record them as an historian. And when he realized that those changes that had happened under Lyndon Johnson in particular, voting rights and civil rights and Medicare and Medicaid and immigration reform and NPR and PBS, all of that mm. was still there. They were part of our daily lives. And he felt a solace and a sense of fulfillment. In those last couple of years, he was probably happier than he'd been in a long time. So the book became something really important to both of us. What a gift that was. You talk about the fact that after your husband passed, it was a struggle for you to finish this project that was a labor of love. You write, I found myself edging toward a commitment to finish the project, influenced by headlines announcing divisions between black and white, old and young, rich and poor, divisions that made it increasingly evident that the momentous issues emanating from the 60s remain the unresolved stuff of our everyday lives. I think that's what really decided me. I knew if I were going to work on it, it was going to take years. My books take so long, so it was a huge commitment. And I was going to be writing as an historian, not simply as somebody writing about my husband. And so once I realized that the 60s really had a message to the people today, and I believe that's so because we look at the 60s in a sad way because it ended with the riots, it ended with anti-war violence, it ended with Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy being killed. But when you start at the beginning, it was a decade in which young people in particular were powered by the conviction they could make a difference. I mean, they joined the Peace Corps, the people who were in the Freedom Rides, in the sit-ins, in the marches against segregation, marches for the denial of vote. The beginning of the women's movement is there, the gay rights movement. It's a time when the air is filled with that belief that if you work together, you can change the government. And those outside movements were essential. That's what allowed the civil rights movement. It was those children's crusade in Birmingham that fired the conscience of the country when Bull Connor sent his dogs against those kids. And then it was the Edmund Prentice Bridge and what happened in Selma. It was what happened in Selma that made the, the Voting Rights Act possible. And that's when change happens. And that's what young people have to realize today. There's such a sense of can we make a difference? They feel a sense of they have deep values about gun safety, about right to choose, about climate change, about democracy, and wondering, can it really matter? And it, you look at the 60s, and they had patience. They had discipline. Mm -hmm. They marched, and it took a long time, but it came so. They changed the system of segregation. They changed voting rights. They changed social justice in the country. So I really want young people to look back at that decade and feel empowered by it. That's the real message of the book. In, in addition to the possibilities that exist today, what 
are the parallels? What are the biggest parallels that you see, the biggest unresolved issues from the 1960s? Well, surely race is still an unresolved issue. I mean, when you think about, I remember Dick said, and I felt too, I was listening to the speech that Johnson gave, the joint session of speech, and when he talked about we shall overcome, he mm. drew in the anthem of the civil rights movement to the highest ch channels of power, and you knew then that voting rights would be passed. And that was a huge change. I mean, black people were unable to register to vote in all those southern states. When the Civil Rights Act passed, and all of a sudden, Jim Crow laws that have been there for 75 years, now anybody can go into a restaurant, they can go into a hotel, they can go into a school and, and know that they can, they can be integrated. So systems tumble down. And that's what we need systems to tumble down now. There's a lot of problems in this society. Social justice has not been fully real. It never is. Progress is never a straight line. And I think that's what we have to realize. We get so impatient because mm. it seems to be going backwards today. And that's happened before. But then you have to just push it forward again by that same collective action. So I'd just be out, if I were young, I'd be out in all those marches right now. <laughs> I probably will be anyway. Well, you write about you and your husband really is, is being incredibly engaged as activists. You say he recognized that his greatest loyalty lay neither to Kennedy nor Johnson, but to his country and to his long held mission to pursue whatever work might help to close the gap between our national ideals and the reality of our daily lives. Did you gain a deeper understanding of what drove him? And what drove you, really? I, I think I did. You know, you, you look at your life, and it somehow seems to be random how it all happened. But then I look at his in particular, and ever since he was young, he somehow had that desire. He loved the country very much. He was a patriot. I mean, yeah. we lived in Concord, Massachusetts, and he would go to the North Bridge and drag everybody there and recite the old days of the Revolution. But there was a gap between what the country stood for and where we were at any time in history. And those are the people I've written about myself. I've always chosen people who were moving towards social justice. They all had flaws, like all leaders do, but at least I could wake up with them in the morning and know that I liked them and I, I respected them. And you talk about that element of your husband, particularly as it relates to the Great Society, this notion of the Great Society. You say there was emotion in Dick's voice as he recounted for me these developmental months of the Great Society. This is what it was all for. We wanted to. No, not wanted to. We believed we were about to make the country far better from top to bottom. It was an awesome, intoxicating time. I love that word, yeah. intoxicating. What did it feel like? What did that intoxication actually feel like to live through it? Yeah, I mean, I was an intern in, this, in the summer of 1965 when the 89th Congress was in procession. And every time a bill would pass, we'd go out and celebrate. We really felt just as you say, that the country was becoming a better place. I remember particularly even two years before that being at the March on Washington, and it was the first time I'd ever felt a sense of something larger than myself. Um, I carried a sign, Jews, Catholics, and Protestants unite for civil rights, and I felt like we were part of something bigger. And I think everybody wants to feel that way. There's a sense of your ambition is for yourself, but you want an ambition for something larger than yourself, for the country. And I think in the 60s, we had leaders who believed in that. I mean, they are historic leaders. And part of that reason is because at a certain point, their ambition becomes something larger. When LBJ came into power, for example, and was told, you can't possibly go for the civil rights bill now. It's stuck in the filibuster. You'll hurt yourself. You can't run in November after, if you've done that, nothing will get through. And he said, well, then what the hell is the presidency for? That's a great mm -hmm. moment when, when a leader realizes that there's something larger than their own career. And it's what we need in public life today is just that sense. John Kennedy talked about politics being an honorable vocation. We need young people to feel that again, to want to go into public service. People did in the 60s. They did in the 30s. They did at the turn of the 20th century. I mean, Lincoln said, don't call me a liberator. It's the anti-slavery movement that did it all. Mm. It's always the outside movements from the ground up. Change takes place. So we can't search for heroes right now. We've got to search for ourselves and for the people that are willing to fight for making our country a better place. Well, when you look across the political spectrum, do you see leaders right now who are meeting this moment where so many people wonder if our democracy will stay intact? I mean, I don't know that we're fighting it the same way we need to be. This is one of the most perilous moments. And there are people, obviously, in local areas. There are people in states. There are some people in Washington. But the overall sense is sometimes we've become too much of spectators watching what's happening to ourselves. And, and the, you know, one of the things Dante said is that the lowest place in hell 
or for those people in a moral crisis who remain neutral or remain silent. We are in a moral crisis right now, and that's what history... I always feel so so positive about what history can teach us because we've lived through really hard times before. And these are hard times, however, and it won't get better unless we act, unless we take seriously our citizen responsibilities and use the qualities of character that we need to bring into politics. The story that you tell about Johnson basically saying he's willing to put his presidency, his reelection on the line in order to push through voting rights. Right now in our politics, that's an anomaly. Politicians rarely are willing to put their reelection prospects on the line. It's really hard to understand because you would hope when people go into public life, they have a larger ambition. It's such, it's such a great thing to be a politician if it works right. You know, you're learning different kinds of people. You're learning diverse environments that people are in. If you've got empathy, you can understand larger things. And if you've got the right character, you can be an example for people. That's what Teddy Roosevelt said. The most important thing about a politician is to example. We want our politicians to be examples for our children. And what does that mean? They, they have to have humility. They have to have empathy. They have to have resilience. They have to be accountable. They have to be have integrity and compassion. And the kind of things you want for your kid, you can acknowledge an error when they make them and learn from it and grow. I mean, one of the fun things was watching John Kennedy grow. When I, when I learned when Dick was on the campaign trail with him that he really wasn't a good speaker at the beginning. <laughs> he spoke so fast. They said he was, it was like going back to a, a, a kid going back to his seat because he didn't want to be up on the stand. And then he would ask reporters, though, how did I do? Where did I lose them? Where was I good? And he learned to slow down. He learned to become a better speaker. When the Bay of Pigs happened and he made a terrible mistake, he made himself honor that mistake and acknowledge that mistake. He went to a breakfast meeting before he was going to meet with the press that first week after the Bay of Pigs, and everybody was blaming the CIA or the State Department or the National Security Council. And he said, no, it's my responsibility. And just saying that lanced all the problems. He, things had been terrible for a week, and he took responsibility. And then suddenly he said that great stay, saying that, you know, defeat is an orphan. Um, success has a thousand fathers. Defeat is an orphan. And then his polls went up to 83 percent because he had done a human thing. And then he learned from it and he made much different decision making structures for the Cuban Missile Crisis, which was so much important later on. And that's what you want in your leaders. They can have humility enough to learn and grow and, and, and grow if you don't. And if you don't allow your ambition to be something larger than yourself, then you're just stuck in a place. And I think a lot of people are stuck in that place today. You have compared this perilous moment that we are in right now, actually to the 1850s, uh, when slavery expanded and then obviously the Civil War happened. What are the parallels that you see in our political divide right now? Do you think it's that dangerous that the country could in some ways split apart? Well, there's, there's two parallels that are scary. One is that the media at the time was very divided. Mm -hmm. The only way you got your news, basically, in the 1850s was by your party newspaper. So if you were a Whig, you read the Whig newspaper. If you're a Democrat, you read the Democratic newspaper, Republican newspaper. So if Lincoln's in a debate with Stephen Douglas and you're reading the Republican paper, he did so great. They carried him out on their shoulders and it was triumphant. You read the same debate in the Democratic papers. He was so terrible, he fell on the floor in embarrassment and was carried out. And so that's one of the similarities in terms of the divided networks we have today, mm. the divided cable channels, social media divisions. The other one is that what Lincoln warned about when the Civil War was starting was that if you allow, the reason he had to fight for the Union to be restored, if you allow the Southern Democrats who lost the election to secede from the Union one state after the other because they didn't like the results of the election, then democracy is an absurdity. And that peaceful transition of power has been with us ever since 1860. And that's the scary thing about what happened in 2020 and January 6th, and still people not, not accepting the results of that election. How afraid, how concerned are you that January 6th could happen again? Well, because we're not remembering it correctly, that's, that's what history... Sh I was so certain as an historian, and I was on television saying, this is going to change public sentiment just as certain things happened in the 50s that made people understand in the 60s that slavery had to be ended. Public sentiment finally got changed. I thought it had. But everything is so breaking news today, and one thing tops on another. I thought the summer after January 6th, when the hearings took place, that would change public sentiment. 
But I still think in the end that the majority of the people understood what happened in that election. I think the majority of people are for the basic values that we're talking about right now for democracy. And it's just a matter of them speaking out and recognizing that it is in danger. And it's up to us. It's not up to somebody else. It's up to us to save it. You often quote President Lincoln as having said that the public sentiment is the most important thing. And you add that public sentiment is different than public opinion. What do you mean by yeah, that? What he meant by that was that public sentiment is when a settled feeling comes upon a people that they know something is right or wrong. And they finally knew that slavery was wrong. And then he knew that the war would be won. He knew that slavery would end. Public opinion can be more fleeting, can depend upon an event and go back and forth. And I do think that in the end, if people really do feel that they have a role in saving democracy and the peaceful transitions of power and, 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 and people putting in themselves in government who are going to put the country ahead of themselves, it's going to happen. I mean, it's happened before. That's where, that's where history helps us. You know, we, we forget because we know, we know that certain things ended the right way. We know World War II. <clears throat> we know that World War II ended with the Allies won. They didn't know that at the beginning. Mm. And we're living in that time where we don't know the ending of our story. But it's up to us to write that next chapter. So that's what gives me hope. And history tells us we've gotten through these times before. This is a really tough time, but I, I think we'll get through it. You said something very notable shortly before the 2020 election. You were asked what kind of leader would be needed for this moment. And you said someone with empathy who can see the other side, resilience because we are going through a crisis, courageous optimism, ambition for the greater good, not just himself, someone who can build a team that will question his assumptions and someone who can be trusted. In 2024, as we sit here today, would you add anything to that list? I think the most important thing that is the sum total of what all those qualities are is character. We meet people of character. It's what you want in your children. You want them to be the person who, if they lose, accept us. You want a child to accept loss. You want them to glory in triumph. You want them to share in triumph. You want them to have empathy toward other people that are different from them. You want them to be resilient when, when a tragedy or an adversity occurs. And those are the kind of things we want in our leaders right now. Mm -hmm. So character, I think I would add that all of those together mean that we want people of good character. Um, Teddy Roosevelt once said that what you want in a public leader is the person who lives next door to you, who's your friend, who will never make a promise he can't keep mm -hmm. and will keep his word. And I think words matter, and we've learned that now. One of the, one of the th things I think I learned the most from the 60s was that words could inspire, words could change people's feelings about themselves in the country. We're learning that words can hurt and words can divide right now and words matter and they can't just be taken back at the end of a day when something is said in the morning. Do you think that people still value character in the way that they did in the context that you're describing it? I don't know. I mean, I think, I think people value character in their friends and in their children and if they'd only realize that that's what they need in their public leaders as well, more importantly what, than what they believe in in policy, you really need somebody in character. If somebody's a good character, then they'll figure out what the country needs. Um, if they're simply being voted in because they agree with you on policy and they have a bad character, then there's really no hope that you can really trust them. Trustworthiness. I think when you ask what I might add to that mm. is trustworthiness because people used to trust in the government and trust in our leaders. And ever since, I think, the credibility of the war in Vietnam and then Watergate and then all the succeeding decades and now different facts being partly at issue, um, people don't trust, and that means they don't trust in themselves either to, to change things, trust in collective action. They don't trust in government. Government's not out there, it's us. Well, the other thing that you say about Teddy Roosevelt is that he thought it was a threat to democracy to have different people from different regions of the country, different economic classes, different parties, look at each other as being the other. Do you worry that that has infused our politics, our culture, today and is that part of the challenge that the country's facing? I do worry about that. I mean, I think that's the real problem is that as he was warning at the turn of the 20th century, which was a time echoing ours in many ways, mm -hmm. that if people in the country felt suspicious of people in the city and saw them as the other, if people in the East felt suspicious of the West, if people in Republicans or Democrats felt suspicious of each other, then we don't have a commonality as American citizens. And what's going to draw us together as American citizens if COVID didn't do it, if, if the January 6th didn't do it, I just somehow feel the impulse to want to have that happen again. 
has to be brought out. And maybe it's by state leaders, it's by local leaders, it's by kids standing up for what they believe in right now. Um, there's no easy answer to it. I mean, I sometimes used to think about national service as an answer where young people could go from one part of the country to another part of the country on a common mission, because a mission combines people. My youngest son joined the Army right after 9-11, mm. and he was in Iraq. And he'll say that the fondest memory he'll ever have of his life, maybe, is getting a group of mm. kids from different classes and sections and religions together in a common mission in combat. And we need that in peaceful combat at home. In a mission, there's so many things that could be done. Mm. Disaster relief, helping people to learn, teaching older people. Um, if only they could get together, but I know how hard it is to do that, and that's, that's a, a long-range project, but one that I wish we could get started on. And when you think about Teddy Roosevelt's concern with the other, when you think about some of the language that we're hearing from uh, the Republican presumptive nominee who has referred to migrants, for example, as poisoning the blood of the nation, do you have concerns that that type of language creates a sense of the other? No question. I mean, rhetoric matters. Words matter. And you talk about immigrants as, as animals, and then people begin to think of them as something different than humanity. And, and on the other hand, you talk about all the people being part of a country with common ideals, then they feel collectively connected to one another, and they feel empathetic toward different kinds of people or different religions or different sections. The reason why the turn of the 20th century so echoes ours is it was also a time of great change. The mm. Industrial Revolution had shaken up the economy much like the tech revolution has today. You had a gap between the rich and the poor for the first time. You had a lot of immigrants coming in. You had people in the country feeling like, all oh, those sinful people in the city, we don't want to be like them. And you had all these new inventions that changed the pace of life. But somehow Teddy Roosevelt was able to come up with the idea of a square deal for the rich and the poor, the capitalist and the wage worker, and soften the, the worst exploits of the Industrial Revolution and capture middle progressive America. And, and I, that's out there now. I still think it's out there to be captured if, if it could be. And the Republican nominee uh, has yet to accept the results of the last election. Within the context of this conversation and your concerns about the nation's democracy, how much of a threat do you think the democracy is facing right now? And do you think the country can survive this threat? Well, I think the real threat is when the Republican can former president says that if he doesn't win, he won't accept the results of this next election, which means that we may have a recurring battle for who's really, who's really elected each time we do this. And that's a real problem. I mean, all the candidates, when you look at the ones who lost, it's really hard to lose. And every single one was able to say, as, as Carter did, I promised I'd never tell you a lie. This hurts. It really hurts. Or Al Gore working on that concession speech that my husband was honored enough to help him on, where he talks about the fact the law of the land has said that this election is lost. I don't agree with it, but I must do it. And Hillary Clinton say we not only believe in the transition of power, we cherish it. I looked at all those, and it just makes you so proud of each one of those candidates who'd been through an election, they'd lost it, they'd let down their constituents, and they were able to make that transfer of power. And it's an essential part of our democracy. And it has to happen this next November. As we sit here today, how concerned are you that it may not happen? I, I am concerned that it may not happen, but I somehow think if the majority of the people come out who have different values from that and they vote, voting is absolutely essential. Mm -hmm. It's the premium value, as, as Lyndon Johnson said, it's the, it's the one thing that all the rest of our democracy depends on. And what is democracy? You throw a candidate out or you call him in. You either want him to come in or you want to throw him out. We have to be able to do that. And I think if the, if the majority comes out to vote, and the majority never comes out in enough numbers to vote, not only young people, they've made a big difference in 2020, 2018, 2022, and they're saying now that they may not vote if they're not happy with either candidate. Um, again, if they only could know what we felt like in the 60s when we felt we were making a difference, you feel larger. You feel a sense of, of exhilaration, the word you used earlier. And I just hope they feel that this election could turn on them and the uncommitted people and the undecided people have to come out and vote. And we have to just take the results of the election. That doesn't mean we know how it's going to happen. But if the overwhelming majority vote, then somehow maybe it won't be as close as we think it is going to be. And then we'll have a clear, clear cut choice. You have said history is always going to take a long time to look at a president. How do you think 
history, the historians, the future Doris Kearns Goodwin will write about these moments we're in now? Um, I think it's going to be a really hard period to understand. I mean, already historians' polls, there was a recent one that put President Trump at the bottom of the poll. It, it's, it's early to do that, except for the peaceful transition of power. I mean, I think it would have taken a while to figure out what 2016 was all about. But to be able to, to look at that and say that this was the time when one president did not accept the loss, I think that's what historians are, are basing a lot of it on. But it still will take time. I think 50 years from now, it's going to look different. 100 years from now. The one thing I wonder about is that I'm glad I'm an historian now because the gold for us is letters and handwritten diaries and memoirs and, and, and the kind of emotional connections that people establish in handwritten letters. We'll know much more about ourselves. We'll see ourselves in, in full dimension. We'll see our videos of ourselves. We'll have emails, perhaps, and we'll have staccato tweets. <laughs> but it's not going to be the same as what it was like when you could really read Seward writing a letter to his wife during the Civil War and telling her not only what Lincoln was doing all day in the cabinet, but they were looking at the moon and I miss you so much. And you get that full-blooded person in it. So that I'm really glad. And that was the, the treasures that we had in the boxes with Dick that there's nothing like looking over the shoulder of somebody writing a letter and feeling you're connected to them. They're still alive in your mind. I mean, the whole, the whole, hope, of a tran uh, the whole hope of an historian is to bring somebody who's not alive back to life again. You know, and that's what I hoped I was able to do with Lincoln and Teddy Roosevelt and Franklin and LBJ. But, but if I've been able to do it here, you know, to bring the people from the 60s back to life that I knew and those people that are closer in, in my memory, um, then I will feel I've done something good. And this is also a way of keeping your husband here and all of his work and the lessons and the legacy that he left. You know, even, even as he was living in those last couple of years after the cancer had taken hold, he kept feeling that it, we both did. As long as we were still explore, exploring the boxes, as long as we were going through them day by day and laughing and learning and finding new things, that, that it was our talisman, that he, we'd both still be alive. Mm -hmm. And even till the end of his life, the, almost the last day, he told his oncologist, he knew he didn't have a lot of time left, but he hoped he'd finish the book. So it, it's amazing, but in a certain sense, it's a metaphor for what an historian wants to do, that people really aren't dead. You can bring them back to life. And it's not just for the people who are on Mount Rushmore or the people who are in movies. All of us think about the fact when we've lost somebody we loved, a parent or a grandparent, how do you keep them alive? You tell their stories to your children and your friends and your family, and then they live that way. So storytelling is at the heart of it all. I hear so much optimism in your voice still. Yeah, I, I think I was born that way, and I think it's the only way we can live. I mean, it sometimes may sound naive. I mean, I remember thinking what I was feeling when I was at the Civil Rights March, that we're going to change America. Maybe we didn't change America completely, but we made huge changes at that time. And if you have optimism, at least you have the confidence that if you act, something will happen. And it may take a long time, as, as Martin Luther King talked about, the arc of the universe. All of that stuff is, is, takes a long time, but it moves toward justice, and I do believe that. Thank you, Doris Kearns Goodwin, for this Thank incredible you. conversation. I'm so glad to have been with you. Uh, I'm so glad to have been with you. This was wonderful. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.